I think we all agree that we were pretty darn lucky to have known George. Uh, but the, and I think the neatest thing was George would say, oh no, I'm lucky that I got to know all of you. And that's the kind of guy that, that George was. And when I think of how lucky we were, uh, I was thinking of how we should all be that lucky. You know, I driving out to his house, I think we should be so lucky that when we're 95, we plant an apple tree from a seed, <laughs> anticipating the apples we're going to get, and then actually get a lot of apples on that tree, so many that we can sell them. And I, I, that just seemed amazing to me because it almost made me sad to see an apple tree being planted because I thought, geez, George will probably never see that become a big tree. Well, I got to tell you that around the front of the museum, if you didn't see it, is our apple tree. And it's one that George uh, grafted for me, uh, showed me how to do it. So we went out there with two apples, with bare root, and uh, he cut off a sign from his tree. And he did one, and he showed me, and I did one. And then he said, have you ever done this before? And I said, no, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. And he said, well, it's pretty neat because I, this is probably the last one I'll do and it's the first one you do. And so the apple tree is, is very important to us. And it's in the front yard and it looks pretty darn good. And Gary, I want you to take a look at it so you can, you can attest to whether or not it's gonna, gonna make it okay. Because it, it looks good and it, and it just had some blooms on it. Uh, something else, I, last night I was uh, Googling George Briott and I, I urge you all to do it, because if you just keep clicking next, you'll find the darndest things. Uh, I thought I knew a lot of things about George, but in 1977, he patented a, a sprinkler. The, the, under, the under something sprinkler, and to, to read what it was supposed to do was so complicated, I have absolutely no idea what that sprinkler was supposed to do. So maybe, maybe somebody out there remembers when, and. and Carol, if you ever remember the 1977 sprinkler, uh, fence tight was a whole other story. I, I could get fence tight. That, that was a real basic kind of a, a tool. Uh, I'm not sure if it's downstairs or if it's upstairs, but we have uh, his floor model for fence tight. Uh, you know, and George, it, that was his story. I mean, he invented anything because I think as a rancher, and this is, I always wanted to try to figure out what the heck was the secret? What did George do that I might try to copy? And as a rancher, I, I think you always try to do something a little better and a little faster so you could do a little more. And I don't think George had anything in his house or anything on that ranch that hadn't been modified by him. He didn't have rakes like you and I. He didn't have shovels like you and I. He didn't have anything like, like at least like me. He tinkered with everything, even down to the stuff he had fun with when he invented his horseshoe, because horseshoes weren't good enough. He was gonna make a better horseshoe. So I, I, I think of that, I don't have anywhere near the energy to, to try to emulate George. Uh, when he told me that uh, he knew he was slowing down because he was taking naps, I knew I was really in trouble, because I commented earlier the fact if I have to wait till I'm 100 in order to take a nap and not feel guilty, then I'm already in a whole lot of trouble. And, uh, and, and that was, uh, again, that's the, the story of George. Every time I went out to visit him, I came home tired because he wore me out walking around the ranch, showing me something. And I don't think I'll ever forget, and I don't even know how many years ago, he's walking backwards up the hill towards one of his lakes showing us something and caught his heel on a, on a, uh, a root sticking out of the ground. And I just, I, it, my heart sunk because I just imagined George going down. And instead he just gave it one of those, he turned back, caught his balance and just kept on talking. And my wife and I just stopped in, in stunned silence <laughs> and stared at him. And I, you know, up until, well, up until very recently, George had that energy. The idea, again, I guess, when he turned 100, he carved his age on a block of wood on his doorstep. 
And then when he turned 101, he carved it. And then 102, he carved it. And he really didn't have enough room at 103. And that's what we should be so lucky to do, is run out of room when we're carving our ages and run out of room. At, a, at his 100th birthday, he talked about getting an extension ladder because his goal was to reach 100. He did. He just pulled the extension ladder up. Got it up down near another four years. That's uh, just just the remarkable stuff. Uh, 2002, he was in Canada, Alberta, Canada, the World Championship Horseshoe Contest. Uh, maybe some of the horseshoers will comment about that. The article said he was the oldest uh, competitor at the time. I remember him saying he's just concerned whether he should do it or not. Are you kidding, George? That's just incredible. What an opportunity in your 90s to go to Alberta and, and compete in the World Championship. Just, just amazing. But enough of that kind of stuff. I, I want to tell you about George's connection to, to the museum. You can see his, his things are all around us. Uh, if you don't know about the sign, the sign that says museum is the head plank off of a wine barrel, 5,000 gallon wine barrel from his dad's winery. I think when they moved from Santa Rosa, they took a lot of things just in case, just in case prohibition was gonna end and they're gonna get back in the business. But George knew that plank was kind of a, a, a rare one and he kept it in the, his barn and it was just used as a shelf. And he was worried about it, that, that what if, uh, somebody just saw it as a board and cut it up. So he asked if, if, if he thought making a sign out of it would be a good idea, and we thought that would be a great idea. So he decided on what to put on it, and I thought this would be like a three or four month project. I thought that you know we'd go out there and help him get it out of the barn. I don't know how he was going to set it up. I don't know exactly what kind of tools he would use, but it was two days after he told me he, was, he thought of this idea that he asked me to come out and see what I thought so far. And he had it sitting outside on sawhorses. He had already laid out the museum. He did that in paper, and so then he could uh, cut around it. And I, I was a little shocked at how far he'd already gotten on it. And then it was two days after that, he said he was pretty much done with it. But the bell that on this end, he was gonna carve the bell to look like the bell from Hill School that's on the mantle in the museum. He didn't like the way it came out, so he said he had to erase it, which he meant just peeling the wood off of it and starting over. Then he asked if, if we thought it would be okay if he copied the bell off the postage stamp. He wasn't sure if that was gonna be uh, like, I don't think he was worried about it being legal. He just didn't like that he was copying something, I don't think. But he had to make sure we understood the round opening where the uh, museum sign is. That's the manhole. That's where a person would climb down into the tank. And I'm not sure I've never met anybody that could climb into that tank. I think George said he could when he was a kid, and he may have gone into that. The, the wooden bungs that are, that are attached to that, George made sure they would stay there. They're, they're drilled through, and then he's put a piece of wire to secure them to make sure that they're, they won't come out. So then he finished carving it, and then he oiled it up, and then we brought it down here and set it up. And you can see his signature on the bottom right, which says George 100, or Griot 100. And he wanted to know if that was okay. He signed his name a little different. He signed it with wire instead of carving it in wood. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. So it was 19, we're not sure, mid-90s when we first met George uh, at, a, at the Odd Fellows building upstairs. He brought some of his iron sculptures there and he had them on a turntable and I was taking a photograph of it with a film camera, which I guess is kind of how old this is. We didn't have digital cameras. And I was struck by, as the metal sculptures turn, how lifelike they look. And it struck me how pretty unique that you could take iron and make it look that real. Uh, I hadn't seen how he did it. In Gail Baron's video that we're, we'll show over here in a, a bit, he talks about how he got the, the bends just right. You know, he'd look at his own arm, see it bent, and get the, get the angle just right. But from that meeting, uh, 
I, I, I think that's when we became pretty good friends. George called a couple of days later. I think he looked me up in the phone book and, and said he enjoyed the, the meeting and, and asked if we'd come out and visit. And then we had an exhibit at the library sometime in the 90s. Uh, and then it was on our way to an exhibit at the Petaluma Library. And the Petaluma Library was fun because a lot of George's family came down that as well, George's friends. And when we left the uh, exhibit, everybody had their trunks open. Because what I didn't know was uh, George's friends and family would bring him wood. It was this, uh, it, it was like a training episode. Find, anytime you found a cool piece of wood, you bring it to George because he might do something with it. And I'm guessing his barn is, is full of that wood. But on the way down to the Petaluma exhibit is when George said that he would like to see a, a permanent museum. And what could he do to help that? And he had already thought about starting a fund to be able to secure a, a, a foundation for the museum. And it was then that he said he was gonna leave $10,000 a year for 10 years. And then he smiled and said, if, I, if, if I'm here for 10 years. But he wanted to make sure that it was gonna be to the best use. And so we talked about how to do that and we wanted to make sure, and I wanted to make sure, that there was no way that a donation of that size would ever be able to just be spent and gone. So what George did was establish an endowment through the Community Foundation, and it's only the proceeds from that endowment that can be used only for the ongoing support of the museum. So we made sure we would never be able to just go blow any money and no future generation would just be able to blow that on some great idea that turned out to something else, that turned out to not be a good idea. But George's endowment has not been touched since it was established almost 15 years ago. It's, it's been added to by others, by the museum, by our volunteer work and our other donations. And it, and it continues to grow, and we have not touched it yet. The goal is, is that we are creating this foundation for the museum, and that someday we will maybe hire our uh, executive director and kind of launch into the next step. But it's that foundation that we have grown on, and it was George's faith in that, and I think our reciprocal trust in George, George trusted in us, and I'm proud that, that he trusted us, and I think we've done a good job of it. We've been, we've been very stingy. We've worked hard for the other monies that we've raised, and so we just can't be more connected, more proud of what George did, not just for the museum, but I think what George did for the community. His, uh, his love of Windsor, and I don't want to leave out Healdsburg. He loved Healdsburg as well. His mailing address was Healdsburg, so I guess we have to to, to let that go as well. But uh, I, I, I know there'll be uh, some other stories. Uh, I'm sure there's be a, a, a zillion fun stories, but I want to make sure that, that folks understood the, uh, George's commitment to the, uh, the endowment in the museum. And I, I guess we've named the room, it's the George Griot Room. Uh, and I hope all of you get a chance, if you haven't been inside, to go inside and, and visit. And almost everything outside is something from the Griot Ranch. And uh, makes me think how, how many holes he dug digging some of these things out of and how many places he, he prowled around in the hills of, the, of, of Chalk Hill. He made little uh, card holders out of a piece of mahogany and he said, because when he was a kid he went up and there was a, a pump organ sitting on the porch of an old shack in the hills outside of Chalk Hill. And he, and he hauled pieces of it home. And I, I thought that was just astonishing. Who, for starters, who in the heck would haul a pump organ into a, the hills of Chalk Hill and to a shack? And so I asked him if he ever wondered who was in that shack. And he looked at me and said, well, of course, it was one of the riches. So I never dawned on me, Eleanor, that this is probably something from the family, that, that this somebody in your family hauled a, a pipe organ out to 
the ranch, but George, as a teenager, I think went up and salvaged it. But that was George. He salvaged, I think, anything. Anything and everything that might be used sometime. So, anyway, we're glad he did, and I'd like to pass this off to somebody else. I know there's a couple of folks. I know uh, Deborah Fudge is here. Wanted to say something. Uh, Karen Alves might say something. So, who's gonna? I'm Deb Fudge, a Windsor Town Council person, and I met George 10 or 12 years ago through Karen. Where's Karen? Oh, there she is. And, um, tenor, and Karen was saving one of her trees. I'm not sure if it was the bay tree or the olive trees. <laughs> and I had met Karen, and it was about a year or two later, and Karen said, you have to meet George, and, and you need to go up and, and go to his house on Chalk Hill Road, and you can't have anything else to do that day. You can't have a time limit. You can't just go for an hour. You need to have the whole afternoon because we don't know how long we're going to be there. <laughs> and so um, George, I think um, Mike and Karen took me up, and we were there more than three hours. And I was exhausted following him around, just like Steve said, and learning about everything that he had done up at his ranch and everything that he had made and, and the tools that he had made and the wooden tools and, and just how he lived his life. And it was amazing. It was three hours of nonstop um, you know, history. And I was exhausted. And he was, and he was the one doing all of it. And I was just listening. But then I, we became friends. And um, he then, uh, every time I would run into him, I'd ask him more about history. And I live in an, in an old farmhouse on the east side, a 1934 farmhouse, and I told him which one it was. Oh, I know who built that, and, you know, and he told me all about who owned it, how big the parcel was, when, who planted the prune trees, you know, in the 1910s, and, you know, who owned, you know, all of um, um, Henry and Vicrest and Ellsbury, the Ellsbury lands, and, and so, you know, we all learned a lot of history from him, and how amazing was it to have someone alive that knew the history like in person you know he wasn't just telling history he remembered and knew the people and um, then he and I would start talking about trains because I'm on the board for the smart train and so he started telling me all about the trains in Santa Rosa well I knew about some of them but I didn't know about the the narrow gauge rail that went by Memorial Hospital you know, and he says he started telling me where to look. You know, drive around Santa Rosa when you see a right of way that's really narrow and there's nothing in it. That's where the trains went, and that's where his dad's Alpine Winery was. And and um, you know, it was just. And so he was really excited that the smart train was coming back. You know, that he could see trains coming back, and we were hoping it was in his lifetime. Um, I was honored to be at his 95th birthday and his 100th birthday, which we held right here, and um, it, and just. I remember him talking about the, the um, he needed more rungs on his ladder, and who knew he would make it almost four more years. And I had on my calendar, in fact, it was a birthday reminder. You know, have those little birthday reminders that come up on your computer, and it goes beep. You know, George Grant's birthday, and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> but um, how how amazing that he made it almost four more years. I also felt close to him because my grandmother was born in 1910. And she was born exactly three weeks after he was born. And she lived in Sonoma, and she died 15 years ago now. But I kept looking at George thinking, technically my grandmother could still be here because he was older than she was. And so he also helped me feel close to my grandmother, you know, who had been gone for so long. Um, Sam Sam, a council member Sam Sam is here too, and he, he'll, he might get up and speak. But on behalf of the town, we just want to thank George for everything he taught us, everything he's left us. So much wouldn't be here, it, you know, we wouldn't probably have this museum if it weren't for what he was able to do with that endowment. And for all of you who introduced him to me, thank you so much. And that's the entree for Karen to come up. But um, he's just someone I'll never forget. Um, my last story is he would be my date at the Polenta Feast. The, the Windsor Historical Society polenta feeds, and he would be my date until the last couple of years when he didn't show up. And so we'd sit next to each other, and one year I turned to him, I said, you know, if you were 45 years younger, I would have married you. <laughs> and he just put his head down and turned all red, and I said, I'm serious. And so that was sort of our little joke, but 45 years, what an age difference. But it was just such an honor to know him, and I just, you know, for his family and friends that are here, the town of Windsor would just like to thank him for all he's done for us. Karen. Most of us here today 
recognize George for being a farmer, an artist, a friend, a father, an uncle, and a grandfather. But to me, he was not just a friend, but he, in fact, was my mentor. Um, I met him when I was 50 years old, and that was 14 years ago. And at that time, I thought ha more than half my life was over. And very quickly, George made me realize that really my life had really only just begun. Because the things that I could accomplish in the next half of my life would probably be the things I'd be remembered for, besides raising my family. So losing George was um, quite hard. And for me to be up here talking about him today really means a lot, and I thank Steve for inviting me to do that. As I go forward in my life in Windsor without George, there's going to be many things that's going to remind me of him. How many of you hike in the regional park off Foothill in Arata? If you do, there's lakes up there, and George had something to do with those lakes being built along with other farmers in this valley. And I know for myself, when I go up there to hike around, I'm going to be walking on that land that George walked on. He also was really instrumental, along with Eleanor Rich, in helping me establish the Heritage Tree Ordinance here in Windsor. And the first tree is in the Foothill Regional, or excuse me, Foothill Community Park on Foothill Drive. And it's a big, majestic bay tree. And whenever you're missing George, go sit under that bay tree because that used to be a part of his ranch and the rock that memorializes that tree came off of his ranch on Chalk Hill Road. He himself digging it up and having it ready for me. And the little tribute that uh, Barbara Ray wrote talks about that day when he called me to come and get that rock. Well, now that there's an apple tree here, <laughs> I'm really curious, Steve, if that's the apple tree that's growing in front of his barn. Okay, well, okay, so I was really happy to hear that because there is a little, George was also a poet. I don't know how many of you knew that about him, but he gave me this little booklet with some of his poems in it, and the one right on the front I picked to read today, it's just one sentence, but it meant a lot to me, and it says, seeds sprout, a tree starts life and nature's art unfolds. Well, one day George called me and he said, Karen, sadly, this big, beautiful oak tree in front of my barn is gonna have to come down because an arborist told me that it was decaying in the middle. And he called me because he knows I'm a tree lover and he wanted me to know before I found out, drove in the yard, the tree was gone. A few days later, he called me and he said, well, sadly, the tree wasn't as bad off as we thought. And uh, so we lamented about the tree, but the good news was it wasn't going to cast a uh, shadow on his garden anymore. So he felt his garden would probably produce better, which it did. A few years later, he called me and said, you're not going to believe it, but there's an apple tree growing right where that, that old oak tree was. You've got to come up and see it. I went up and saw it, and sure enough, in years as that tree grew, it was uninhibited, so it grew very straight and had the most beautiful canopy on it. But probably the best part about it is that it's an apple that nobody has any idea what kind it is, and it is probably the best apple you'll ever eat. A couple of years ago, George asked Gary Blasey to uh, sell that apple at the Windsor Farmers Market and of course that meant that they had to go through the agricultural department and all the red tape of that to just to sell an apple off George's little farm and they named it at that time and so now that apple is a registered apple in Sonoma County and when you go to the Windsor Farmers Market or the Hillsburg Farmers Market you might see that apple there if not off the tree here the trees that Gary, in fact, has grafted off that same apple tree. So, and he named it George's Wonder Apple. So look for it the next time you're at a farmer's market in late summer or early fall. Other things that are gonna remind me of George is uh, sitting in his living room, there was no better view than Mount St. Helena. Probably the best view in all of Sonoma County from his living room. 
There's also a beautiful eucalyptus tree down in the valley that's now owned by Chalk Hill Winery. And when you go into the griot room right here, you're going to see another carving similar to this one right here, and you'll see that eucalyptus tree there. And that's the view from George's living room. And as you go through the museum, you'll be reminded of what it was like to sit there. The other thing is I cannot ever smell kerosene again in my life without thinking about George. And Steve's over here laughing. But George, in fact, if he got a scrape or a cut or a burn, he treated it with kerosene. And the first time, I, he used to tell me that. He had an old can that was his dad's with kerosene in it. He, his dad had had it, uh, when George and his dad had had that thing for 100 years. And it had kerosene in it left from his father. And one day I came into his house because he didn't knock, he didn't come to the door when I knocked. So I got worried. Oh well, no, you know, where's George? So I walked into the house. He comes around the corner and his arms are just flailing all over the place. And I said, George, what's wrong? He goes, I want to show you how strong I am. I took a fall today, but I'm fine. I'm not hurt. I got up, but I did scrape myself. And as I got closer to him, I smelled kerosene. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, you smell from kerosene. He goes, yeah, that's what you use when you scrape up your arms. And I go, well, that would be fine, but the fire in the fireplace might not be a good idea right now. <laughs> oh gosh. So as I said, I won't be able to smell kerosene without thinking of George. The other thing, these cypress trees out here, between them, there used to be a lane right there that led to a dehydrator here. And I enjoy listening to George's stories about bringing his prunes over here to be dried. And I used to work in the prune orchards myself and took prunes to dehydrators. And I loved hearing his farm stories. I love hearing him talk to Gary Blasey. And, Gary, and him always asking Gary, how are the grapes, how are the prunes, how are the pears, how are the apples? We're going to miss them. So in closing, there's one more poem that I'd like to read because I really think that it sums up George's life, really. And uh, it's got the perfect title, A Golden Lifestyle. A mountain with majestic splendor inviting to man, a valley with green lace pastures fading to tan, a lake with shimmering, shimmering waters to behold, a field with ripened grain and tones of gold, a stream always beautiful when it flows, a tree nature's art unfolds as it grows, a farm a source of living if one toils, a plow a modern tool to hold, turn the soil. A home, the place to raise your family so dear, a place to enjoy life year after year, a church where loyal worshipers go for giving, a barn necessary always for country living. A split rail fence, a barnyard forms, a livestock protection from harsh storms, a span of horses to cultivate fields, a dedicated man to produce crop yields. A cow or two, some pigs and sheep, a woman churns butter, butter she stores and keeps. A boy has pets, a lamb and a rabbit, a girl helps with chores, a matter of habit. A flock of chickens to produce eggs, a few large turkeys with meaty legs. A country scene repeated almost everywhere, a wholesome family they gladly share. A garden is planted to produce needed food, a necessary part of a family's mood. A harvest, a bountiful harvest is always enlightening. A season of drought is very frightening. A resource family is hard to keep down. A healthy attitude breeds nary a frown. A praise for farm folks with duties untold. A class of people worth their weight in gold. Thank you, George, and we're gonna miss you. I prob probably have known George longer than most of you. I came to live on the Griot Ranch, it'll be 71 years ago, in June. I was 15, and I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I had recently lost both of my parents, and uh, my brother was on the ranch already, and I had already had a trial um, nine months with an aunt in Fillmore that didn't work out too well. I was terribly lonesome. So they took me in also. Uh, my, 
my uncle worked for George, as did my mother's four brothers at one time or another during the Depression. So I heard about George Briot before I ever saw him. And I helped Isabel in the kitchen, washing the kettles and stuff from the um, canning and the milk and milking the cow every day. And Ray's crib was in the kitchen. It was the old schoolhouse that they lived in at that time with the bus barn next door that I took into Hillsburg High School. I never, ever had it so good. I thought all this food, it seemed like it was free. And on my 16th birthday, I picked up windfall apples way up in the back on the hill. So my memories of George and Isabel go way, way back. I'm now a great grandmother of 10, a grandmother of four, and a mother of three. And my husband of almost 67 years is Harold Thompson. We live in Vallejo now, but uh, when George pitched his um, horseshoes in Vallejo, we were there. Anyway, he, Isabel was one of the nicest uh, ladies. She was such a lady that I ever knew. I can see my grandmother lived on a ranch across the street. And they'd get together in the afternoon for coffee. My aunts were um, Norwegian. So they'd get together and have coffee, and Isabel was always mending, always mending, darning socks, always mending, never, ever still. I learned a lot from the Griots. Thrift, humor. I mean, I learned my first naughty jokes <laughs> at the foot of a master. Believe me, my uncle, between my uncle, who is only 14 years older than I, and George, my goodness. <laughs> anyway, it was a very, very happy time in my life, and I have never lost touch with George and Isabel. All my children have all visited, and two years ago, our family was here from Dallas, and we took the two little boys and my grandson and, and granddaughter-in-law out to visit George, and all little Henry could say later, I can't believe I know somebody 102 years old. <laughs> so uh, my brother that is uh, almost no longer for this world would be here today if it weren't for his um, cancer. And he is succumbing to that very soon. But he sends his very best to everyone that he might have known. Thank you so much. This is just perfect. I am a museum volunteer from way back. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm not that great a speaker, but my recollection of uh, George goes back approximately 70 years ago. And I'd just like to share with you the visit to myself and Jack, my brother, had with him uh, approximately two weeks before he passed on. <clears throat> we went to visit him and I'd heard a lot of stories over the years about George and the things he'd done, but he was in a very talkative mood that day. And so we just listened to his stories as he thought of them. And so I've heard many stories of the same things, but not the same that he, the way he told them. As most of you know, uh, we had the Duvander Ellsbury Ranch, and I never knew exactly, although I heard many stories, how it got started. And George just started off talking, and he said, one day he was working at the dehydrator and he needed some help. And he talked to his friend Don Duvander, and Don said, well, if you need some help, I know this fellow, Pat Ellsbury, that's in Santa Rosa and just started out and looking for some work. 
and George said, well, bring him over. So he came over and they worked together on this dehydrator, dipping prunes. And this is George's story. He says, they became very good friends. And over a period of time, he says, Pat said, hey, there's this ranch over, over on Brooks Road that me and Don would like to purchase, but we don't have any money. George said he's thought about it for days, and they became better friends and better friends. And he went to his bank and was able to raise the money. And he goes in, went into great detail. Oh, he had some good harvest and had some bad harvest, so he didn't have a lot of money. But he went to the bank and raised the money and loaned it to Don and Pat to buy this ranch. Now understand, Today, when you do that, you have attorneys and contracts. This is a handshake. And he relied on them to pay him back. So that was the beginning of the Duvander and Ellsbury Ranch, in his words. The other thing I'd like to share is, he was looking out the window, me and my brothers sitting in front of him, he was looking out the window at the mountains and the valley, and he was looking and he said to us, he says, you know, my eyesight is very bad. He says, but I look out this window, but some days I can't see out through the glass. But I really do see, because I know exactly what's out there. So I see the mountains, and I see everything out there. He said, the other thing, he says, I can't go down and get my mail and the newspaper anymore. I used to walk down this long driveway and be able to pick it up. But he says, I know every rock and every tree, so I walk it every day. Anyway, God bless George. It just makes me think of talking to uh, Jim Duvander the other day, and, and Jim was remembering when the ranches, I guess the ranch split, and Don and George, Don Duvander and George, were going to share work with each other. So Don would work on Jim's, I mean on George's, and then George would help Don. And Jim Duvander said what that meant for him as a 10-year-old, that he was starting working 14-hour days, uh, seven days a week. <laughs> so his memory of that that, that great uh, merge at the, or the uh, split at the time just meant a lot of hard work. And I think that's what a lot of people remember, George. That's a lot of hard work. It was a lot of hard work, and he loved it. Uh, just another quick story, and if anyone else is interested in, in sharing a story, please come on up. But... You know, George, uh, George's interests were pretty wide and varied, and I'd come home after visiting and <laughs> tell my wife, well, you won't believe what we talked about today. But uh, the most unusual for me at the time was the discussion about whether or not medicinal marijuana was a good idea or not. And I said, you know, it's just not the conversation I expected to have with somebody approaching 100 years old. But he had been thinking about it because of an article in the newspaper and a friend of his that was undergoing a, a, a treatment. And, and he had been thinking about that for a while. And I, I, I'm pretty sure he had an opinion, but George was pretty, uh, uh, pretty good about not, well, to me, George wasn't very opinionated. I'm not sure. He, he was probably opinionated with some, some of you folks. But but I, I like that wide openness of his interest. He was, uh, he read the newspaper, I think, every day, front to back, and uh, probably had a thought about it. Uh, his comment about the last time he had to fill out his report uh, to the state water agency about his lake was that it hadn't changed and got, I don't know how many years, 60 years since he started it, had the same amount of water, it was the same information, but now he had to pay a fee. And across the top of that thing, he just wrote, Highway Robbery. <laughs> Hello. My, my name is Mary Carney. Sixty-some years ago, the year 50 to 51, we were looking for housing up here for the year. And it was impossible to find anything. But finally, we met the Griots, who had this barn on their property that was in the European style with living quarters on the second floor. And that is where we lived from 50 to 51. We knew that George came from an Italian winemaking family way back. And this was a kind of an unfamiliar culture to us. We had never lived in, in these areas. 
One night, George invited Bernie, my husband, to come over to have a little band schmooze together. And he said, he offered Bernie, he said, here, we'll have a glass of grappa. And Bernie said, grappa? What's grappa? George said, oh, it's like wine. <laughs> he proceeded to bring out two glass, like tumbler, tumblers full of grappa. And they started talking and sipping the grappa. And time went on. And eventually the tumbler full of grappa disappeared. And Bernie thought it was time for him to head home. He couldn't get up. <laughs> well, when George would open a bottle of wine, we usually had a glass that was about that tall. It was the Hazel Atlas, the, the old jar that, uh, to, that was, but that was lunchtime. So I guess we weren't going to be doing a lot of drinking there. You know, George won the instant wine cellar from the Healdsburg Museum. I think everybody thought, what's he going to do with all that wine? They plowed right through it. <laughs> I think he shared it with a lot of people, but that was that was a long time ago now that when that was that that wine was done. Gayla Barron had sent her apologies. Uh, Gay's husband passed away uh, earlier it's a few months ago, and Memorial Hospital has a quarterly memorial for uh, people, and today is a memorial for Gay's husband, and so. She was unable to be here because she was going to attend her husband's memorial. But she did send her, her greetings to the, the family. Here you go. Hi, I'm grateful to be here. I, I see members of the early days gas engine club in the audience having no idea that I would run into people I know up here. I live in Santa Rosa. My name is Tom Jacobson. and. My father's here, and he was George, his mother and father, and his sister Marge Jacobson uh, were George's closest neighbors on Chalk Hill Road. And I, I don't feel he's comfortable coming up here and talking about it, but I'm extremely grateful that he that he shares memories with me of when he was much younger, and his future brother-in-law and himself had a handmade boat they took over to George's Lake long before I was ever born and I'm just grateful to hang on to memories like that sharing with my father Bob Jacobson and like I said his his mother and father were George's um, closest neighbors on Chalk Hill Road Maud and Edwin Jacobson and they're all gone now but my mother and father are both here and I'm so grateful to, to be sharing in the celebration of life with the man I admire and have never met. Oh, well, I'm not much of a public speaker, but uh, I had a couple of things to say about George. Uh, I met George maybe 15, 20 years ago uh, through a co-worker, a friend of mine, because uh, he would, went to school with uh, one of George's daughters. And uh, he knew what a special guy that George was, and he, uh, he thought I'd like to meet George, and that's how we met. And uh, uh, of course, I came and I admired all of the all of the, all of his accomplishments. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, one of the things that really really uh, impressed me was the lake. You know, of course, he uh, he designed the lake and convinced uh, other people to to, uh, to make uh, two more lakes, as you know. Um, and uh, the lake's got a lot of fish in it. And I asked him, where'd you get the fish? He said, well, you know, uh, in Santa Rosa, I read the paper that they were gonna clean up this pond or lake or something over there. And so, so the water level was low. So I went over there and I captured some of those fish and put them in my lake. And he says, and that's how, he, uh, that's how he got his fish in the lake. He said, most of the fish there are descended from the original fish that he took from the lake in Santa Rosa. So uh, I thought that was really quite interesting. Uh, and of course, he had a, he built a float on the lake, you know, because uh, uh, the geese and the ducks would come, and if they nested along the shore, uh, you know, the uh, oh geez, uh, the raccoons and uh, coyotes and whatever would would uh, would uh, would eat the eggs and chicks. So he built that float, but he was uh, he said it wasn't too good though at first because uh, the float, you know, I put it on a rope. 
and uh, the wind would blow, and when, when the float uh, when it reached the end of the rope, it would give a terrible jar. So, uh, he said, I could have put maybe a spring on there, he said, but I got all of these old tires. And so he cut the tires up in little strips like that, long, long, long ones. And so he made a rope out of this, out of these, these tires, and, uh, and that would absorb some of the, uh, <laughs> some of the, uh, some of the impact when, when the, uh, uh, when the raft blew out. And, uh, I thought that was, uh, really, uh, amazing. And, of course, he took a lot of uh, old tires and truck tires and he cut them up and uh, bend them in certain ways and rivet them together and he made easy chairs and uh, a lot of things out of those rubber. You know, uh, They're all long gone now because they all rotted away, but he did a lot with tires. It was, I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, one of the last times that I saw him, because I would see him about, oh, I'd see him about four times a year. In, uh, I live in San Leandro, and uh, he even came out and visited me once uh, uh, with a couple of his friends, drove him out there. Uh, but he, he was going to work on something. I don't recall what it was. He was going to going to work on He was going to make a, some sort of a gizmo, a gizmo of some sort. And uh, he says, but, you know, I don't really know how to start. So I told him, well, why don't you look at stuff? And he stopped me right away. He says, no, Bob. No, he says, uh, if you look at somebody else's stuff, he says, then it'll kind of poison your mind. It, it does away with, with uh, originality and creativity. If you want to do something, that has to come from your own mind. You don't, otherwise you'll never, you'll, you know, you'll, uh, you'll always think about, about what you've seen and what we will do would be, uh, would be copying and maybe modifying somebody else's design. You can't do that. And that's the only time that George ever kind of barked at me on that, and I never forgot that. And he is absolutely right. You got to think about that. And uh, I have, uh, uh, I have followed his advice. You know? And uh, of course, I can't be nearly as clever as George. You know, George was one of a kind. He was the best of the best. I brought a lot of guests up there because I was so impressed. With him. But he would always give away one of his uh, little wooden things. You know, to put, you know, he'd carve something or he'd put it on a lathe. And uh, she's my house. I've got I've got several of his things, and uh, I've got a sister who is uh, in Parkinson's disease, and she's she's really not well. She has trouble walking, and of course uh, she's visited George too. And the last time we were there, uh, you know he uh, he handmade a, a, a couple of canes, and he was uh, he gave her one, and she still uses that cane today. That's the kind of guy he was. Hi, my name's Holly Hood. I'm the curator at the Hillsburg Museum. And George was a good friend. I'm so happy to be here with all of all of these people today, all of you today, who knew what a special, wonderful guy he was, and always will be. Um, his his physical address was Healdsburg, technically, but as we all know, his heart was in Windsor. When he started talking about the Windsor Historical Society and forming a museum, he actually called me over to his house, poured me a glass of wine, and looked deep into my eyes and said, Holly, I, I got something kind of hard to tell you. I didn't know what it was going to be. <laughs> and it was that he was planning to focus his donations in order to create the Windsor Museum and the Henry House. And he wanted to make sure that I understood no hard feelings towards Healdsburg, uh, no hard feelings towards the rest of Northern Sonoma County. He just had this mission and he felt that uh, if there were things that the Healdsburg Museum should have from his collection, he wanted to make sure that he passed those on. But he really wanted to see this place happen. Uh, he wanted to build the collection, he wanted to build the endowment. Um, so I said, hey, no hard feelings, George. <laughs> and uh, when Deb Fudge earlier talked about going to the polenta feed with George as her date, I think I used to do that with him to go to the Hillsburg Historical Society things after <laughs> he stopped driving. My husband gave me special permission to take George as my date. <laughs> so for a lot of us, we know what a great friend he was what a lot of history he had. 
and that this legacy will live on through this museum and through all of us who loved him so much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle Trammell, and I'm going to be telling this story on behalf of Edward and Jason, who's a really good friend of George's. He's known him about 27 years. Jason's known George about 27 years. And how they met was Jason and his brother, cousin, and two other fellows were trespassing on George's property, and they went fishing. So my boyfriend kept seeing uh, Jason, kept seeing somebody from behind a tree, like lurking around behind a tree, and he goes, I'm getting out of here, there's somebody back there. And the other guy said, no, no, you're crazy. And then here came George running up, <sighs> out of breath. And he says, okay, I know you guys can beat me up. And they go, Oh, sir, we're not going to do anything like that. We're just we're just here trespassing. He goes, well, this is private property, but you guys kind of look like good guys. And they said, yeah, we are. And they go, well, what do you like to do? And he goes, well, what do you like to do? And they said, um, well, we like art and stuff. And then so George and them continued to uh, tour the house. He took them on a tour and everything. And I guess this was in 1987. And since then, uh, Jason has remained friends with George and um, been real good friends with him over the years. But... Jason's not here today to tell the story, and I just thought I might share it with you, so thank you very much. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Dana Parnay, and I teach at a high school up at Hillsburg, uh, but I'm a Sonoma County resident for a long time. And um, back in the mid-90s, I came back from working in Alaska and bought a house in Santa Rosa, and one afternoon I just was walking through town, and I passed by Doyle Park, and I saw them pitching horseshoes. And I had pitched horseshoes when I was younger, but hadn't pitched for a long time, and there I was with my hands on the fence, just looking through there, and a couple of the guys said, come on in, I pitched some shoes with us, and so, and so I did. I met George in passing, and the guys in the club were really nice, but I only played for a little while. But the thing that came out of it was that my dad, Ray Parnay, who was in his 60s at the time, um, I talked to him about it, and he loved pitching shoes, but hadn't done it for a long time either, and he joined the club. And he ended up pitching for many years, and became somewhat friends with George. And then one day he called me on the phone, and he was really excited. His horseshoe pitching had improved, and... Uh, he said, well, there wasn't enough people to play in the upper level, so they put me in there in the top level of horseshoe pitching, and I got to pitch against George. And he was so excited about that, and he said, he's the finest man I've ever lost to. <laughs> and so at some point, my dad took me over to George's place, and I took the tour like everybody else did and wore me out, too. And I was a lot younger then, even than that. Um, Every week, my dad would bring a sandwich over to George, and they'd sit down and play some cribbage. So my dad said, you got to come play cribbage with George. So I did. I, I sat down and played a game, and George beat us both. Yeah. And in the most unassuming way, and if you know George, you know how he was, he said, well, I guess I got lucky on that one. Yeah. And I venture to guess that would be the only 99-year-old I will lose cribbage to. <laughs> After his father passed away, we knew how much George liked cribbage, so my wife and I went out and played cribbage with him once. We thought we might do it weekly, he just whooped us and was like, well, we're, maybe we're not going to do this every week. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Marilyn Duvander, and I knew George almost my entire life. Um, my dad and George were good friends, as Sonny just said. Uh, so he... He was in our house very often as well as I was in their house very often because his oldest daughter and I were best friends. But one of the things, and, and they stole my thunder, I was going to talk about playing cribbage because we learned how to play cribbage when we could count to 31 and uh, or add to 31. And so uh, it was uh, an honor to play with George also, but my dad taught me how to play and we played cutthroat. And so we would steal 
points if somebody missed it. But uh, George was such a gentleman that he absolutely would not play cutthroat. And so if he missed a point, we could not take it. <laughs> but he didn't miss points very often. But we were, we were, it, it was an education to uh, play crib with both my father and George. So, lessons in life. Yeah, I don't think he bowled when it, it, when I knew him. He was extremely proud of the hand-hewn beams in their house. Uh, I think everybody that was involved in building that house uh, was probably worked to death doing the handwork on those large beams. Uh, the, the relationship that George had, as he always talked like he was a kid, and it all, dawned on me that he was only talking from probably from when he was 60 years on up. And he's telling me stories about things he did. It sounded like he was probably a teenager when he did it. But I think with Don, with they dismantling things, bridges and uh, the railroad platform up by, uh, up towards Healdsburg and salvaging wood. And I, it was like, he sounded like whenever he found something good, he wanted to bring back to Don as well because they were such close friends. He didn't think he could have just one of them. So. It, the idea of finding a giant round rock somewhere down in the valley, but he needed to get two of them so he could bring one back. And I can't remember if it was Don bringing one back for George or George bringing one back for Don, but they both had these giant round rocks, which, I mean, that's, that's friendship to, to cart around rocks that weigh tons, I guess, just, just so you can share them. So. Anyway, anyone else? Uh, Mr. Bozzi, are we going to get you up? Okay, we'll, we'll tell the, those stories offline. <laughs> Uh, Carol and the rest of the family, uh, thanks so much for sharing your dad with us. Uh, you know, we, we, we missed him the minute we knew he was gone. Uh, all my projects around the house, I always pause and say, how would George do it? What would George do? Now we just have to imagine. And, uh, and I guess that would pass George's muster if we, as long as we imagine uh, on our own and figure it out. But uh, what a delight, what a pleasure, and again, we are so lucky. We were so, so lucky.